Hello everyone. Hola, buen día. So in these series of lessons, we have been bringing you inspiring stories of women from the Hispanic world. And today, in this lesson, we are going to talk about two women artists from Latin America, two outstanding women artists from Latin America, whose stories are so inspiring, they are actually role models for the next generations. And these two artists are Frida Kahlo, the painter, and Alicia Alonso, the ballet dancer. And both these women overcame severe physical difficulties, severe physical suffering, and stand out as the top leading women artists in the Hispanic world that history has produced. So as we said, these two women artists who have made history not only in the Hispanic world actually, but in the entire art world, and it, they have done it thanks to their effort, to their tenacity, and their desire to fight against all odds. And it is because of this reason that they stand out as uh, you know, role models, as I said, inspiring generations of not only young artists in the world, but I would say all young people. So we are going to talk today, as I said, of Frida Kahlo. She was born in 1907 and died in 1954. So, you know, from the first half of the 20th century, she's a Mexican painter. I'm sure many of you have already heard about her and seen her paintings. And then we will talk about Alicia Alonso from Cuba. Uh, Alicia Alonso is a very well-known figure again. She was born in 1921 and at 96, she's still alive today. She's a prima donna of classical ballet and one of the leading figures in Latin American dance known all over the world. In fact, in our times, there are a number of uh, Latin American women artists, painters, sculptors, dancers, and many of them have made a mark and are well known in the world. But historically, actually, very less is known about women artists in general, and particularly about women artists from this region of Latin America. In fact, in the history of Latin American colonial art, there's hardly any mention of women. There's almost no reference to female artists. The first Academy of Art, which was created in Latin America, which is the San Carlos Academy in Mexico, did not allow women to study in it. And it was only at the end of 19th century that the names of Latin American artists, you know, women artists, began to be known. Since the 20th century, of course, women have had a more significant role in the development of plastic arts, dance and music in Latin America. And if we think of painting, Frida Kahlo is an outstanding painter, along with, of course, very many other women artists of Latin American modernity who are equally remarkable. And I could tell you the names of particularly a few of them. For example, Tarsila do Amaral and uh, Anita Malfatti from Brazil, Remedios Varo from Mexico, uh, Amelia Palaez of Cuba, to name just a few of these women painters of the beginning of 20th century. Frida Kahlo herself, as I said, she was born in 1907, but uh, you know, she always claimed that she was born in 1910. Why 1910? Because that is the year the Mexican Revolution started. You, you must have heard the name of Emilio Zapata, Pancho Villa, the great Mexican Revolution. So she wanted her life to be identified with modern Mexico. And I think this detail gives us an idea of her singular personality characterized since her childhood by a deep sense of independence and also rebellion against you know, normal, ordinary social and moral habits. She was moved by passion and sensuality and she was proud of her Mexicanidad, of her Mexican identity and you know, cultural tradition set against the reigning Americanization of culture. And all of this mixed with a peculiar sense of humor for which she is very well known. Her life was marked by physical suffering, which started 
with, uh, with the polio that she contracted at the age of five. And as a result of this polio, her right leg was thinner than the other. But even so, she was a very dynamic and agile child. And uh, in 1922, she entered the National Preparatory School of Mexico City, which is where she used to live. And in fact, this was one of the most prestigious educational institutions in Mexico. And it was only in that year, this academy had started admitting girls and uh, to take, you know, drawing and modeling lessons. So it was precisely in this school that, you know, she would kind of get this basic training as an artist and she would come in contact, she would meet the person who would be her future husband, the well-known Mexican muralist Diego Rivera who had been commissioned to paint a mural in the school auditorium and whose big murals with native art and indigenous motifs are so very well known in Mexican art. So her physical suffering actually, you know, there was something worse that was to happen apart from the polio. She suffered a tragic accident when she was just 18 years of age. You know, the date is written in her paintings also. It was September 17, 1925, when a bus accident left her with permanent injuries. Her spine was fractured and as well as several ribs and, you know, her pelvis. Her right foot was completely dislocated. Her shoulder was disengaged. And, you know, a handlebar pierced her from the stomach to the pelvis. The medicines of uh, those times, the way medical science was, you know, the treatment really tortured her body with surgical operations. She had some 32 operations throughout her life. She had to wear corsets of different kinds and, you know, mechanical stretching systems. Later, in 1929, she married Diego Rivera, the famous muralist that we've talked about. But because of her injuries, Frida never had children. And it took her many years to accept this truth of her life to accept her fate so the boredom of having to lie down so many hours you know all the time in the bed that is what led her to begin painting and in 1926 a year after her accident it was a sketch uh, done in the traditional style of the religious paintings of mexico you know the ex voto or the votive paintings traditionally these paintings are executed on sheets of tin plate and portray the scene in which a miracle occurs. The miracle in this sketch is that Frida did not die, despite the serious accident. One of the characteristics of ex voto sketches or paintings is that the scene is described in a double way, in drawing, but also in words. And many of Frida's paintings will incorporate the ex voto style elements. In 1926, in the same year, while she was still in her convalescence, she painted her first self-portrait under the title Autoretrato con traje de terciopelo, meaning self-portrait in a well-wed dress. Now, this would be the first of a long series of self-portraits in which she would express the events of her life and also her emotional reactions to them. Another one of her self-portraits, for example, is titled Autoretrato en la frontera entre México y Estados Unidos. So this is the self-portrait on the border between Mexico and the United States. Uh, Frida made this painting in 1932 when she and Diego Rivera were living in New York. And she was kind of nostalgic of her country, of Mexico. And in this painting, she shows her sentiments towards the United States. The background is full of images that evoke the two countries. But in her hands, she holds a flag with Mexican colors, making it fairly clear where her heart lies. She used to wear traditional Mexican outfits, you know, long, colorful dresses with exotic jewelry. And she wanted her work to be an affirmation of her Mexican identity. So she frequently used techniques and themes extracted from the folklore and the folk art of her country. This, along with her, you know, the way she used to dress, and her close-knit eyebrows became the trademark image of Frida Kahlo. In 1939, she exhibited in Paris in the Renault Coyet Gallery, thanks to her friend André Breton. 
and during her stay in the French capital, she also met famous artists like Pablo Picasso and appeared on the cover of the French magazine, the French uh, version of the Vogue magazine. By then, Frida was known throughout the world. And in the spring of 1953, the Gallery of Contemporary Art of Mexico City organized for the first time an important exhibition of Frida's works. Frida's health was very bad at that time and the doctors told her not to attend the opening of the exhibition. But minutes after all the guests were inside the gallery, they began to hear sirens from outside. So the mad crowd headed outside and there was an ambulance accompanied by a motorcycle escort. Frida Kahlo had arrived in her exhibition on a hospital bed. She was placed in the center of the gallery. The crowd came to greet her. Frida, in her usual style, told them jokes, sang and talked to the people the whole afternoon. And of course, the exhibition was a resounding success. The same year, they had to amputate her leg below the knee due to a gangrene infection. This plunged her into a great depression. And she finally died in Coyoacan on July 13, 1954. Her last words in her diary were, Espero que la marcha sea feliz y espero no volver. Meaning, I hope my march is happy and I do not have to come back. Four years later, her family home had become the Frida Kahlo Museum. Her life has been depicted in several films and documentaries and one of the most notable film out of them being the US-Canada co-production in 2002 starring Salma Hayek as, you know, playing the role of Frida Kahlo. She was a pioneer. Frida Kahlo was a pioneer whose life was always moving between tragedy and success. But she was a free woman in all the facets of her life. She assumed her political and social commitment as inseparable uh, from her art. And she's certainly the most important Latin American artist of the 20th century. We will now move on to the story of Cuba's Alicia Alonso, an international ballet uh, legend. Her entire, her full name was Alicia Ernestina de la Caridad del Cobre Martinez del Hoyo. So, so she, her short name, of course, which she took on later was Alicia Alonso. And that is how she is known as the prima ballerina assoluta and director of the National Ballet of Cuba. I told you that she's just completed 96 years of age. And as we speak now, she's one of the most important personalities, living personalities in the history of dance. She's a leading figure of classical ballet in Latin America. And she's most known for bringing her personal style for ballet and for popularizing ballet as an art in Cuba. So Alicia was born in Havana in 1921, 1920 some records say 1921 and she was born in the family of an army officer. She was one of the two daughters of this army officer and uh, as you can imagine her family had no shortage of money. It was a rich well-to-do family. So when the family noticed that she had a talent for music and dance, she was quickly enrolled in the Sociedad Pro Arte Musical, the dance school at uh, Cuba. She met her future husband, Fernando Alonso. At the age of 16, she married him and uh, moved to New York. And uh, why New York? Because in those days, if one wanted to be a ballet dancer, there were no facilities available in Cuba and one had to study in the United States or Europe. She soon became one of the founding members of the American Ballet Theatre. And by the late 1940s, she was considered one of the world's greatest ballet dancers. But Alonso remained determined to promote ballet in Cuba. And so in 1948, she came back to Havana and set up the Alicia Alonso Ballet Company. Now, this school was largely funded. Her, you know, it was a private personal school and it was largely funded by the then burgeoning Cuban high society who kind of, these were wealthy patrons who were proud and happy to have their names associated with such a distinguished project. The Cuban Ministry of Education also made a modest subsidy. But by the mid-50s, the company had run into financial difficulties and also some political problems. 
those of you who have done some history of Latin America would remember that these days, you know, in the 1950s, Cuba was under the dictatorship of President Batista. So, uh, and there was already a lot of domestic uh, uh, protest arising against him. And facing this increasingly domestic upheaval, President Batista attempted to recruit the Alonso Ballet Company to his cause. He wanted the group to dance on demand, often in order to just distract people from, you know, the student uh, protests that were going on everywhere. Uh, but when the dancers of the ballet company refused, all their funding was cut. The school, in fact, folded temporarily and Alicia left Cuba once again. This time she joined the Monte Carlo Ballet. She returned back to Cuba when Batista's government was overthrown by the triumph of the Cuban Revolution in January 1959. And President Fidel Castro then sent her a message asking her to make the company what they wanted it to be. So they sent him a big list of their dreams, what they wanted to do. And within weeks, the school was receiving a generous funding. It was renamed Ballet Nacional de Cuba, that is the National Ballet of Cuba, the National Ballet School of Cuba. And in fact, in one of the most evocative and touching stories of the Cuban Revolution, you know, this group of ballet dancers went on a tour of Cuba, demonstrating ballet, showing the ballet dance to people in the most remote parts of the island. Naturally, most of the audience had never seen the dance before and they were amazed to see this. But they understood quite soon what the artists were doing. And Alicia thought, and she has said it in several interviews, that it was because ballet is a natural art. It is the art of movement. And so people appreciated, you know, that movement, even if they did not understand classical ballet. Throughout her career, Alicia Alonso has struggled with her eyesight. In fact, it was in the 1940s, she was a young girl when it was uh, diagnosed that she had a detached retina and uh, she had been through several operations. Uh, she's now nearly blind, uh, but she still actively supervises uh, all the Cuban National Ballet's work. And, you know, she still choreographs. She's got these assistants, people who have been working with her. Uh, they interpret the directions that she gives. Um, Cuban ballet, while it has influences of the Russian and the Soviet styles, is now recognized the world over as having its own unique form. So, through the Ballet National, through this National Ballet School and its network of schools in different cities of uh, the island of Cuba, Alicia and Fernando Alonso have created a uniquely Cuban style of dance. And earning worldwide acclaim, the ballet has performed in 58 countries and has received hundreds and hundreds of international awards. One of her constant battles has been the precisely the preservation of style. As she says, it is the style that turns technique into art, that makes the dancer's art not just a monotonous and expressionless gymnastics. According to Alicia Alonso, it is within the style that a dramatic idea and an aesthetic sensibility is expressed. What she asks the new generations of interpreters is that they attend to these concepts whose dominion will make them true artists. At age 96 and nearly blind, and despite her age, her frail body, Alicia Alonso is still at the helm of Ballet Nacional. She has lost her sight, but this woman who has dedicated her entire life to ballet no longer needs to see in order to create. She has said in some interview that I see the dance and the composition of steps on the scene with my imagination. She has played a pivotal role in ballet in Cuba and on the world stage. Cuban ballet has been at the pinnacle of international dance for decades and Cuba continues to produce some of ballet's best dancers. For Cuba, Alicia Alonso's name is synonymous with ballet. So I hope you have enjoyed the stories of these two women artists from Latin America, Frida Kahlo, and Alicia Alonso and I hope that you will continue to discover them as you study Spanish. Thank you.